Thank you for joining us. Our keynote will begin in two minutes. We'll give everyone a bit of time to log in. It is officially noon. We would like to turn the time over to Vern Waters to introduce our keynote. Take it away, Vern. Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to be with everybody today, um, albeit the strange circumstances of having to be here virtually rather than in person. Um, it was such a pleasure to be with you last year up in Brigham City um, on a lovely fall day, kind of like today. and. Um, just kind of wanted to share with you just a little bit about um, the process of when we decided that we needed to cancel the conference. Um, it was such a, a difficult day of meetings um, when we decided that because of the pandemic that we needed to pull back and cancel. Um, one of the things that um, gave me the most sadness and trepidation was the idea of contacting our keynote speakers to tell them that we had to cancel. Um, we had this little inkling that we might be able to make this happen this fall where we would be able to get to hear their comments. And when I contacted Catherine Coles to let her know that we had decided that we had no other choice, um, she said that she was holding out hope that ours might be uh, something that actually happened. And one by one, her engagements fell by the wayside as the pandemic kind of took over our worlds. Um, so it's such a pleasure that we've been able to work it out and to be able to kind of move those portions of as much of the conference content that we could to this fall workshop. So thank you so sincerely to Valerie and Aaron um, to be able to make this possible. Um, I do have my uh, pandemic mask with me, steampunk kind of plague doctor mask should things get crazy here um, at my office in South Salt Lake. Um, but uh, yes, thank you so much for joining us and I hope that you enjoy the presentation. Catherine Cole's 10 books include seven collections of poems, most recently Wayward from Red Hen Press 2019. Her memoir, Look Both Ways, was released in 2018 by Turtle Point Press. That press will also publish The Stranger I Become, Essays in Reckless Poetics in 2021, and a collection of poems Wouldn't Dream in 2022. 2018-2019, she was the poet in residence at the Natural History Museum of Utah and the Salt Lake City Public Library for the Poets House Fieldwork Program. She traveled to Antarctica in 2010 to write poems under the auspices of the National Science Foundation's Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. She also has received awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She is a distinguished professor of English at the University, University of Utah, and it is my pleasure to introduce Catherine Coles to you. Um, Kate, I'm so happy that you could be with us today. Uh, we're so excited to hear and so happy that you're 
you're here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vern. And uh, I'm gonna follow the directions and share my screen here. Uh, and I hope that you can still see me. I think that you can. It is so lovely to be among librarians uh, who I think are every writer's favorite group of people. So I wanna share a little bit with you um, about librarians and my experience of them. The first one is just from this morning Catherine? I had worn. Yeah. Uh, we, I hate to interrupt, but could you uh, make it full screen, your slideshow? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought- Not a problem. Was. Hold on. Let's go. If you go into slideshow and then presentation. Right. Presentation, slideshow. Hold on. There we go. There you Can you go. see the whole thing now? Okay. My apologies. This whole technology thing, um, as you all know, is a little bit um, stymieing from time to time. So anyway, um, this morning, I had warned everybody yesterday uh, during the run through that we have a lot of chainsaws still going in our neighborhood after the big storm. And I was a little bit worried about that, but I went out this morning and I told the guys working uh, in the yard next door that I was gonna be talking to a whole bunch of librarians at noon. And so if they could take their lunch on time, that would be really great. And they got wide eyed and they said, librarians, they're really smart people. Um, when I was a child, I went to the Salt Lake City Public Library, which is now the Leonardo, and I took out 10 books a week, uh, every week, and the librarian never asked me that question, are you sure that you can read all those books? She knew that I could. Uh, and then I had to pay a dime a day per book if I was late getting them back, which was a lot of money to a kid in those days. In the summer, the bookmobile every week parked right in front of my house so that when I was 12 and wanted to check out Crime and Punishment, the librarian was able to just hop up to my front door and knock and make sure it was okay with my mom if I had that book, uh, which is great. So I decided because of It's You that today I was gonna to talk about and read from this memoir about my grandparents, that's my grandmother on the cover, uh, because it's really research heavy and you're all by nature research geeks, whether you work in archives, stacks, or digital media, all of which came into the making of this book. So just to locate you a little bit, uh, at its heart, Look Both Ways is the story of a marriage and especially of the woman living within the constraints of that marriage. The book begins in the mid twenties at the University of Wisconsin, where my grandparents, Walter Link and Miriam Walliger, nicknamed Mookie, both take degrees in geology with the idea that they will set out together to do the important and exciting work of finding oil to supply the surging demand in the US but there are no women working in the field in South America or what was then the Dutch East Indies where Walter's new employer Standard Oil sends him. To the detriment of their marriage and the two people within it then, only one of them, Walter, is permitted to do that job as he works his way up through the company, uh, eventually becoming the chief geologist and the head of exploration worldwide for Standard Oil. Um, and as he does this, he becomes convinced that this is the way not only things that things are, but the things that the way they should be. So while he faces the hardship and thrills of exploration in the jungles and mountains of South America and Indonesia, which involves canoeing up tropical rivers and macheting his way through jungles while blood sucking leeches cling to his body, pythons coil in wait and poison darts fly at him from beyond the apparently impenetrable foliage. The high spirited Miriam is left behind behind in the colonial capitals to define herself through the limited means left to a woman, women within their small societies, which involved playing bit bridge or polo by day, and also dancing into the wee hours with diplomats and early KLM pilots and the footloose sons of moneyed Americans and Euro the European aristocracies. In other words, they were impossibly and glamorously and recklessly glamorous but of course I didn't know this they were just my grandparents by the time I knew them divorced by then both remarried and living far from each other and far from me 
For me then, the book began in my relationship with my grandmother with whom I was close. When I was in college, I would regularly visit her in Florida, where I asked her to show me the family photos, uh, many of which, some of which showed women in long dresses and men in vests and watch chains, picnicking on the shores of Lake Michigan. Others, though, showed glamorous flappers in bathing suits or tennis dresses, cavorting under exotic trees in places like Batavia, which is now Jakarta, Havana, etc. Over her evening cocktail, instead of putting on the news, I asked her to tell me and then write on the backs the names of the people in these photographs. Fast forward to the early 1990s, I'm married. My mother and her brothers flew to Florida to shovel out my grandmother's house in preparation for her move to assisted living. So my mother, Joan, called me uh, from Florida to read to me a list of the things that she knew I probably wouldn't want or use, but that she wanted to send me uh, anyway, including elaborate tea sets and things like that. Um, so I said, sure, go ahead and send them. But what I really want is the evidence. I want the papers. I want the journals and letters. I want the photographs. I want all that stuff. So there was a long pause on the end of the phone. And my mother said, I think we already threw all that out. There was another long pause while I composed myself. And then I said, well, whatever you didn't throw out, I want it. And she said, I have to ask your grandmother, which I was confident that my grandmother would be happy for me to have it. Uh, and uh, when she did ask my grandmother, my grandmother sort of looked off into space for a little while and then said to her daughter, you do know I fell in love a few times, right? Then my mother packed all that stuff up and sent it to herself. My grandmother died at 88 in 1995, and five years later, I finally extracted the papers from my mother, who had, I think, a fantasy that we were going to go through them together. Um, from that moment, it took me 20 years to research and to write the book. I don't know what was actually lost or thrown away, but I received 80 odd years worth of diaries, mementos, dance cards, clippings, and canceled checks, as well as family photographs dating as far back as, the 18, as 1860. In addition to Miriam's letters to her mother, Mandy, Walter also wrote regularly to my great grandmother. Later, from my uncles, I received his detailed personal and scientific journals of many of his expeditions. Beginning in 1926, he shot approximately 20,000 feet of film documenting his work as well as the customs of the remote tribal peoples with whom he came into contact. For the first time in my life, I went down the rabbit hole of real research. I'm a poet, and so mostly I had been working with things that are about this big uh, on my own page in front of me. Uh, so the research didn't uh, only involve the sorting and the reading and the deciphering of the handwriting on those thousands of pages, but also running down the names of people mentioned in those pages and events and places, not to mention the books and poems the writers were reading and mentioning and which I also read. Eventually, I realized I would have to travel to see firsthand as many of the places where my grandparents lived as was remotely practical. I pursued them to Singapore, Indonesia, Colombia, and Cuba, following as closely as possible in their footsteps. I acquired and used not only current information and travel guides, but also, whenever possible, information and guides from the times when they were visiting and living in those places, mostly the 20s, 30s, and 40s. As I read and traveled, I also broadened my understanding of the larger implications of my grandparents' story as it played out against the development of the energy industry during a period when it really profoundly shaped U.S. scientific development and the development of the state's imperial aspirations and also their foreign policy. In this way, the book is really about a couple of kinds of adventures, the kind that is undertaken through travel, rooted in the body, and the kind that is undertaken in the imagination, here enacted through close and sympathetic reading of the terrain underfoot. My grandparents' years abroad were defining years for them and also for our country, which arguably 
continues to experience its own clumsy crisis of identity. And they were crucial years in laying the groundwork for the relationships that the US currently has with other regions of the world. There were also years during the, which the lives of women, both within the family and outside it, were undergoing rapid and often unsettling changes. In reading the lives and words of my grandparents, my goal be became to illuminate how, as Americans and as men and women, we have arrived in the place we occupy often uneasily today. And therefore, I also want to do fairly deep dives into the cultures and histories of the places where they lived, into political history, into the history of colonialism and exploration, and the history of oil. In other words, I intersected with libraries of various kinds, along with other public institutions devoted to the preservation and dissemination of knowledge all along the way. Which is one reason why, after all that, I'm going to read to you a chapter that Miriam doesn't actually appear in in this book. The chapter follows Walter and his expedition as it climbs deep into the remote mountains of Luvuk, an island in the Celebes. It also follows me on one of my less glamorous but more interesting research trips to the Smithsonian Institute institutions, uh, human studies archives in suburban Maryland outside DC, where my mother and her brothers have donated my grandfather's films. So uh, I'm going to read to you from the book. And um, there are a couple of things that you need to know, because this is chapter 11. It's kind of far in. Um, I quote really extensively from my grandparents' journals and letters in this book. Um, and I do it without a lot of warning. I just embed their quotations into the text in italics if you're reading. But of course, you can't see that. So when I raise my little clicker like this, it means that I have just slipped into speaking in one of their voices. Um, the common language uh, that, that uh, Walter is speaking with his um, laborers is Malay. Uh, he doesn't speak it very well. They do. Um, Walter at this time uh, is recovering from Miriam's emotional affair with his uh, best friend who was the Canadian trade attache in Batavia. Uh, she's back home waiting for him pregnant with my mother. Um, and uh, during this chapter, just as Walter's travels take him away from Miriam, Mine are taking me away from my husband, Chris, who's not all that crazy about all the travel that I do. Um, and then I just want to make clear that as heavily researched as it is, this book is a poet's book and a work of the imagination, not a work of scholarship. I don't put in any scene that I don't have evidence for in the documents that uh, that I use, but obviously you will be able to tell that I've imagined my way into these scenes in a way that the documents themselves don't entirely support. And then one final comment, you'll notice uh, that all of the slides here are sketches. Um, in addition to filming and photographing his expeditions, my grandfather continued the low-tech practice of hiring sketch artists to document them. These sketches are drawn that you're going to see are drawn mostly from the sketchbook that was made on this expedition, with a few exceptions. Um, the expedition became famously known in the family as the Terrible Celebes Expedition. But um, that sketchbook was unsigned. Uh, the artists, who are mostly uh, what my grandparents would have called half castes of Dutch and Indonesian heritage, remained as anonymous as the laborers, which my grandparents called coolies, uh, as did all the Europeans and Americans. And you're going to notice that there are places where I adopt Walter's language, which was the only practical thing I could do given the extent of the quotation that I was doing from them. Um, these laborers were conscript as, conscripted as all but slaves to do the strenuous work of carrying, digging, and building that had to be done. Uh, only one of these sketchbooks was actually signed by its artist, along with the two geologist twans or bosses, and I include that page here in honor of them all. This chapter is called The Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. Luvuk lay on a narrow shelf along the coast, its mountains soaring almost straight from the sea. 
the SS Jacob pulled out at 10 a.m. and with it went the last communication of what we call a civilized world. A packet of letters to Miriam, one to Mandy, letters he wrote to be shared perhaps, but not to be read the way I read them. He stood on the dock, mom's tails tucked under his arm, tales I also read to draw near. The SS Jacob is straight out of the stories, a junkie ship still used to fly around the islands, as are the thatched huts on stilts, the small European fort. With this isolation begins a new adventure. He walked to the Dutch controller's house with its deep veranda. Even here, the depression had hit. A world away, Americans skimped on coconut oil, kept their worn rattan chairs another year. The controller promised 40 coolies. This he is glad to do because in these times, many of the natives cannot pay their taxes not quite indentured labor. In a few weeks, Augerbeck would join him, but for now, he was on his own. I always feel like a little boy in a big, strange, mysterious place. He tended to details, moving toward the moment he would overcome his resistance, making the first start, and the real work, its violent physicality began. It was the part of every expedition he liked least. Here, though I will never enter this particular wilderness, I'm with him. At the start of every adventure, of every book or project, the inertia and the question, how do I begin? The only thing to do is to get it over with. The first start. A vertical wilderness. I've followed him only in words. Now I want to see what he saw. I remember ghostly images flickering in the darkness of his study in La Porte. Joan and her brothers complained wryly about the times he subjected them to his films and lectures, but my brothers and I were riveted. The films, where are they? Walter set out with the minimum of equipment and and food and only 20 coolies to their first camp on the wild Kenton River. In the morning, he took the two most, most agile men to scout the gorge. Above sheer cliffs rising hundreds of feet, a strip of sky glowed hot blue, but below deep in rock shade and mist, he shivered. Late in the afternoon, something changed in the air underfoot, vibration, more intuition than sound. And he paused, gazing upriver. Under the tumble of white caps, a shadow crept toward him, the line between clean water and silted so distinct he could have drawn it with a pen. Somewhere above, it was raining hard. The line swept past. The water, now the color of chocolate, began to rise with a surge. Began to rise with a surge of panic. He contained, reduced to the size of a bean behind his ribs, as he turned the men around. My heart is pounding. I too have been trapped in a narrow canyon with the river rising, cliff faces loosened by water shearing and plummeting around me, though not in a place where my body would never have been found. In 20 minutes, water had inundated the trail. Hugging cliffs, they stepped from boulder to slick boulder. Water swirled around their knees, waists, necks, sweeping with it branches and debris. Walter stumbled through the brown tumult, pulling at his clothes, his feet in their heavy boots like blocks of cement. His two men, all but naked, were quick and sure. They went places I could never even attempt to go, and when we crossed the river to the north side, they stood on both sides of me in heavy swirling water and handed me across. Ten more minutes, ten more, driven by adrenaline, trying not to let it overtake them. Almost an hour to travel a mile. Soon the water would rise over their heads, and they would have no choice but to try to ride it. Desperate, he scanned the rock walls until he found a narrow opening 
they stumbled, the water dragging at his trousers, the river's roar urging them upward a hundred feet to. Finally, they heaved over the lip of the gorge and lay panting, looking down into a wild chute through which entire trees now tumbled. A wash of relief, pure wonder. The current surged, rolling a boulder the size of Miriam's ford as if it were nothing. The noise was terrific. You can get used to anything. They started back along the edge of the gorge, over rocks and mud, treacherously slick. Walter's feet, cold in their heavy boots, couldn't feel the ground. He didn't know he had misstepped until his gravity shifted, one boot sliding from under him. Beside him, the cliff curved into air, 300 feet down into a raging flood. He tried to dig his other boot in, but the ground beneath it also dissolved into mud slick as ice, into nothing. Just as he gave over, a grip bruised his arm, holding him over the chasm. He didn't dare move, even to see which man had him. Again, his body present, all in all. What was there not to understand? I should have been killed, or at least fairly well busted up if those fellows had not rescued me. A little malay between them, flesh and blood, gravity. The men could have let go, brushed off their hands, gone back to their villages. Instead, they hauled him away from that sheer edge, and he lived. If he had fallen a different life for Miriam, for my mother still tucked in her body, I have abandoned them both. I want to be with him, as will my mother, though into the wilderness he'll take only his sons, leaving her to find her own way, which he would never approve. Back at camp, still vibrating, he almost didn't know what to do with himself, alive. He pulled out paper and pen. He wrote Mandy about coming in from the field full of need, wanting Miriam and music. I don't think I ever willingly forced myself on her. I hope not. He drew a map of the Celebes, an X to indicate where he was, an interior place unnamed, as yet uncharted. Here we are different. As always, I phone home daily, part of my bargain. But I don't want to be located, X'd in or out. Don't want Chris to know exactly where I am any more than he really wants to know. Walter couldn't help himself. I never asked a question, though I sometimes wanted to, to suspect a friend is worse than being betrayed. <coughs> the films are in my Uncle Andy's garage, falling to dust, far too fragile to play. I arrange for them to be shipped to Western Cinema in Colorado, where the restorer says my grandfather had an eye, a sense of narrative, wit, it was rare for an amateur to edit film or cut in titles, especially so cleverly. The restorer suggests I sell or rent footage to the industry, but I feel protective. What would my grandfather want? If one cannot get films of them, the native way of doing things is lost. I googled the Smithsonian, called the number listed under donations. I know I explained to the man on the other end that donations means money, but we have films, little moving fragments of history. Does anyone want them? So Walter moved through that extravagant gash up toward the river's source, which he felt under his feet before he heard it, a trembling that he first attributed to quinine drunkenness, a nasty feeling that makes one's ears ring. Waterfalls gush straight from the mountain's face, their scale unreproducible in the 16 millimeter frame. I watch where the falls become lovely billows framed by foliage, his awe measured by the time the camera lingers. They climbed freehand under heavy packs, huddling to rest on bare ledges, trembling with ferns and slick with moss. 
It is a quiet, weird country and has a cold, hostile atmosphere. After two days, they emerged into a valley ringed by still higher mountains, where streams and rivulets came together into a massive confluence before plunging underground. The spectacular fall they'd scaled wasn't the source, just the release of that subterranean aquifer. The sudden rise of the main rivers is not such a surprise. The water created as many problems of geology as of travel, falling over the exposures he needed to see, depositing silt. The rock was illegible, as was his other life, in which Miriam played cards, dined, drank splits. Where was she now? He'd never been able to imagine her, what she might want or do, and she didn't know how to teach him, even if he wanted to learn, didn't know the source of her malaise or how to ask for, even to know what she wanted. Better to think about floods, snakes, danger, dangers he could measure and was equipped to face. In the evenings, he turned to music, to books, his tent a circle of light. First mom, whose tropical betrayals only depressed him, then Maupassant, a woman's life. Jeanne, innocent on the night of her marriage. Julienne, unfaithful even in courtship. I read along, my head bent to the page. Here I'm quoting mom. Was he really the husband promised by a thousand whispering voices thrown her way by a divinely beneficent providence? Was he really the man made for her to whom her life would be devoted? At first, I think, he imagined Julian as Bert. He had one of those smiling faces that women dream of, but all men dislike. But who then was Marion? Who was he? Exhausted, we read together into the night. Late, he picked up his pencil. And now, and now, her whole life was shattered. All joy was dead. All her expectations blasted. The ghastly future with all its tortures, his betrayal, her despair, rose up before her eyes. He drew a firm underline, his heart to Jean's words. He, it would be better to die. Then everything would be over and done with. Characters he could believe in. At night, he entered Maupassant's word, world entirely. I see it now. He was the innocent female, the poor virgin, offered, taken, betrayed. I follow the films to the Smithsonian, a trip Chris almost approves with its well-defined project, destination, and schedule. Every morning, I take the metro into the suburban decline of Suitland, Maryland, which I walk as warily as I did Jakarta, to an anonymous building with echoing concrete corridors and visible ductwork. Archivists Pam Wintle and Mark Matienzo have warned me to bring lunch with me, since I will find nothing nearby. They seat me at a light table where I crank with white gloved hand through the reels, peering at frames through a loop, trying not to break, trying not to break anything. Mark is rightly nervous to have an amateur handling films that now belong to the future, and I try to repay his kindness and patience by making notes for them based on the journals. This shot in Sumatra, 1929. This in the Celebes, 1932 a vanished world. And it's unusual, Pam tells me, his articulated awareness that he is shooting what can't survive and that he is what will kill it. Of course, his awareness didn't stop him any more than mine stops me. The film breaks, breaks again. Walter had promised to meet Agerbeck in Pangimana and bring him back to high country. The world was flooded, every trail impassable, but he left the coolies and hiked the river out, out of the mountains to the coast. At Luvuk, he dropped his shambled boots with the army captain and caught a ride over the pass in a rattletrap mail truck. From his shifting vantage above the high plateau, he sketched drain drainages arranging themselves in fissures east and west, and maps to guide him when he was back down in them. 
In Poe, the postman transferred him with a few sacks of letters, including his own, to a thatched roofed boat with four paddlers. He lay on its wood bottom and drifted in and out of sleep while the men paddled a fast tempo. When they slid into harbor at 1.30 a.m., Augerbeck was smoking on the pier, as if he'd expected the boss to arrive as horizontal cargo in the bottom of an overgrown canoe. They started back just after midday, beds of coral beneath them, bright little worlds through which fish flickered, electric blue and yellow. In Luvuk, the army captain had not only gotten Walter's boots fixed, but found two pairs of light canvas sneakers for wading to fit his size 44 feet. I almost kissed him. Men pulling a boat. The portable Victrola with its lid propped to show a record on the turntable. The heavy needle with its little horn. A title cut in. The Victrola is a rank luxury. Cows and pigs being hoisted onto a ship. The pigs make charming fellow passengers. My back and shoulders cramp. I crank through the frames, caught by his eye, tiny ghosts, a stilled world with his voice running through it, a voice I lean into, I can almost hear. The ferocious Batwi stopped them cold. The natives feared the river as they would a ghost or monster. Its rage, the pythons sheltering under its banks. Walter sent 13 out sick. Out of a dozen freshmen, four deserted before they pulled out. The coolies muttered when he walked by, their fingers flashing against the evil eye. They kept to the riverbank, hacking at foliage until they could crawl through. In mid-morning, Walter pushed through an opening head first into a confusion of loops and coils, shimmering, a mass of snake surveying the country, a head bigger than his own, jaw built to unhinge. Eye to eye, ground level. He eased back through the gap in the brush, called for Agerbeck, who was carrying a rifle. The huge head turned again. The python licked the air, heavy with man scent. Agerbeck took aim. The body writhed, still shining where the sun penetrated the leaves. The head was gone. None of the coolies would get close enough to touch it. The two white men looped a piece of rattan over what remained of its head and, sweating and heaving, pulled the beast out to full length, over 20 feet, a good foot across. The snake's belly was empty. One step further would have put me in the coils of the brute. Nearby was a nest littered with hatched eggs. Walter looked at his feet. The tangled roots seemed for a moment to twist beneath his boots and saw a hand hammered gold medallion, lost who knows when, by what kind of man, to have come this way. Uncovered by rain, its glint catching his eye. In the middle of any jungle, he kept finding gold, the skin of a python, a fossil, moving pictures. Before supper, he wrote Miriam about how he wanted to wrap himself around her. Business is picking up. I'm having adventures this time. They had to make nine kilometers a day to finish before the food ran out. Midnight. By now, Maupassant was dog-eared and worn. Everything was deception and lying. He lay in bed tossing and scratching. Where did these bites come from? Python, elephant, wild boar with its razor tusks, all worthy foes, but something too small to see was eating him alive. Too small to film, though here's a leech on a white thigh, here a foot, his, sprouting mold or mushrooms like a bad hunk of bread, fungal infections from stream water. A plague of ticks, red-winged, tiny enough to pass through the mosquito netting, 
The rains kept coming, the river rose wide and terrible. If they could build a raft and get it once to the far shore, they might run a line and ferry men and goods in shifts. Walter Augerbeck, the mandur, the natives felled and stripped bamboo trees, lashed them together, lowered the raft to the riverbank, repelled the cliff and passed down their gear. Walter christened the raft with a bottle of beer and secured it with rope. He lined the men up on the riverbank, all of them tiny now in black and white. Crossing the Delaware was a snap compared to this. Note the coolie taking off with the line. The first coolie stood in the, in the bow holding the line's free end while the others pushed the raft out into the current, hanging on as long as they could before giving it a mighty heave toward the other side. The current carried it back into midstream before the man could leap for the far shore. Man after man took his turn on the raft they labored through afternoon, wet and exhausted from battling the river. Walter might have to think of something else. The Mandur was short and scrawny, used to command more than labor, and Walter had left him almost for last. Again, the men pushed the raft out. Again, the current began to take it. If Walter hadn't been filming, he would already have been turning away in disgust when the Mandor plunged off the bow into the furious water, momentarily swallowed. His head surfaced, disappeared after a breath breathless second, reappeared, then his shoulders, and he pushed the last few feet up the steep bank. I got a movie of it all, his triumph proof that here against the forces of nature, he knew what to do. I, at last, not only reading, but watching, almost there, make my note on the Batwe River, 1932, crossing in a flood. Once the raft was secured on both banks, they needed six men on a rope and three poling to move it back and forth. A tidal cut in, Bend your knees and bow your head and pull that rope until you're dead. By noon, gear and men were sodden, but all were on the other bank. My husband, my high school sweetheart, my friends, they think I am wild, that I fling myself into danger, that I want to make myself spectacular. Watching this safe in Suitland, I know. My failure is not that I'm female, which is no excuse these days, but that I'm smaller than I look, mere, modern, above all, bookish. I will never be larger than life. Even from her, I am a tragic falling off. Continuous outcrops, H2S seepages, and an oil seep on a monocline, oil, finally, and he was flooded out, water swishing merrily under the tents. They were out of food, but he wouldn't give up now. In the morning, he left the surveyor and a few men behind with the gear and continued with the rest down river, where he'd heard there was a toko, a small native store. He found an abandoned hut settling back into jungle. He shot two fresh doves on the way, a morsel for everyone to whet their appetites. At last, they straggled into Luvuk, where he paid off the men who had finished their contracts. The new men also wanted to be released, but he needed them to get food to the surveyor. And now that he'd found oil, he was determined to finish. Any coolie who ran away would get hard labor and forfeit his pay. They put on a demonstration of weeping, pain, hysteria, like I never saw before, but it did them no good. Walter ordered 25 more coolies, like so many cans of potatoes, at the controller's office in Luvuk. But by now, the locals knew their pay would go to taxes before they ever saw it, and news swirled about Curses, invisible biting demons, famine and flood, snakes as big and monstrous as legend. Finally, 
Walter left with 20 new men and promises of more to follow. Somehow this gang gives me the creeps. That night, an earthquake rolled through, through the jungle and under the flimsy town. For five full minutes, the houses danced on their stilts. Nature couldn't frighten him if humans would only cooperate. But the next day, seven men set off after breakfast without a word or coin in hand. The day after that, he awakened to find only 10 men. He needed 30 to carry gear and food. They stole away like thieves. I am sitting in the soup. I hope they all die. He was content to be tired and wet, to do backbreaking labor, just like an ordinary coolie, as long as he was moving forward his life in his own hands. He never thought about their lives any more than Mookie's, about their hands, which had saved him. It seems such a waste of one's precious young life. One day, two, if the mandur came back with no coolies and he had to cut out, the Victrola would stay behind, his camera, his films, lost to the jungle. Another day passed. Here, he is not much different than the man I remember reciting Robert's service 40 years later, though he is unshaven, dark rather than hoary and haggard. His narrow head is bowed, his long head's ten hands tented, eyes gazing into the jungle while dance music pours out of the Victrola speaker. As the record turns, does he imagine another man or himself spinning her in his arms, silk pouring over her hips like fast water? Four days, no mandor, no man, no sugar, no potatoes. That night, there was the second earthquake. You could see the tremendous trees move and sway. The whole earth felt in motion with a sort of billowy wave feeling. The earth turning to nothing while he rides his cot. After it stopped, he lit his lantern and smoked his pipe, gazing into the dark. Eventually, he reached for pen and paper and wrote to Mandy, all this and news from his last trip to town. One of his own wells had come in, the first to deliver oil for any company geologist since he'd arrived in the Indies. On the fifth day, Agarbeck shot one dove, a mouthful of meat for him and Walter each. On the eighth evening, just as Walter decided he was abandoned, the mandor materialized out of, out of the dense jungle, only two men at his shoulders. The runaways had plied the country with stories, all true. I'm all blown up. If they continued, they would starve. A pan of the clearing, tent frames bereft of their canvas. Deserted camps always carry the sadness of past glory, even if occupied only for a day. They built four rafts and floated to Lovuk, to the world, where Walter found letters from Miriam and news that another well of his had come in. He and Agarbeck went to the club for their first ice drinks in two months, toasting failure, toasting success. He was sitting a few days later in his rented house on a veranda overlooking the bay when the village chief arrived asking for wages for the men who had slipped off into the jungle. Now I ask you, until that moment Walter had planned to let the runaways go, but as soon as the man left, he walked to the government office, filled out paperwork for filing charges, and handed it to the controller with the money he'd withheld for taxes. There would have been more, he pointed out, if the men had finished their work. In a few days, the government had rounded up half the men. These birds were rather surprised when we walked into the courtroom. They had left, the men said, because their loads were heavy huge baskets as big as the men, shoulder straps of twine. They'd never complained about their loads. The interpreter said, did you not realize that your running away would probably cause these gentlemen an undue amount of danger that in cases might be fatal? Yes, the men answered. They had known it, their faces unreadable. <laughs>
The controller insisted on punishment. They could have paid their taxes. Two months, hard labor, no pay. Not so different from what they'd fled, only safer without Walter in charge. I am glad they got socked in the neck for the trick they pulled on us. Were the two who had saved him from going over the bluff among them? In a high meadow, he remembered, he had one afternoon come upon the men unexpectedly. They are always complaining about their loads, but there they were merrily playing soccer football at a terrific pace with a handmade rattan ball. A dozen men having laid down their loads, running and playing. I would like to have seen a movie of that, proof to him of something he already knew. Now I ask you, I'm gonna stop this sharing uh, and come back to you for, uh, for the Q&A. If there are any questions, I don't see any, um, I'm happy to have them. None. Liz, you guys heard all that, right? <laughs> it might take just a minute uh, for okay. people to type their questions in. Oh, looks like we've got okay. one right now. All right, let me take a look. Um, so the thanks, Dan, um, for your question, which is what is the status of the films at the Smithsonian? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that um, we faced is that it's actually quite expensive to um, restore and preserve film. So the earliest uh, of the films, including the ones that I'm describing, <coughs> excuse me, they wrote a grant um, at the Smithsonian to restore those uh, and preserve them. And I have copies um, of DVDs uh, that contain, you know, these particular films that have already been processed and dealt with. And I believe that they can be seen um, if you want to see them uh, on the Human Studies Archives webpage. I should have that information actually, but, but I don't. Um, thanks. D Dan, does that cover it pretty much? Um, if not, you can follow up. Colleen wants to know how I found my career in poetry. And I always attribute my love of poetry to my parents who read Emily Dickinson to me as a child, and also to um, going to church in the Episcopalian Church uh, with the King James Bible and the Old Book of Common Prayer, which I think gave me a sense of the musicality of language. So my mother says that by the time I was seven, I was saying that I was going to be a poet and a fireman because they didn't have female firefighters then, uh, apparently understanding that it's hard to make a living as a poet. Um, and says, I noticed in your bio that your poetry has been translated into Dutch. And it's not the Indonesian connection. It's actually, um, I went to a really wonderful poetry festival in Rotterdam. Uh, that's an international fe festival that is conducted in English and in Dutch. And so all of the presentations and the poetry, et cetera, are translated um, into Dutch for that. And Valerie says, what kinds of stories did your grandfather share with you in person? And, you know, one of the interesting things is not all that many stories, um, which is one of the reasons that I didn't realize quite how interesting my grandparents' life had been. My grandmother didn't share many stories either until I really pressured her uh, about it. But um, he did show us those films. And that was the thing um, that, I, that I always remember. Um, Dan wants to know what other of my works I'm particularly proud of. The, the thing about writers is that they always care most about the thing that they're working on right now. So I'll say that um, I'm really, really looking forward to the uh, work, the book of essays that I have coming out in the spring. Uh, and I also have now two collections of poetry um, coming out, one from Turtle Point and then one from Red Hen. But the other 
book of poetry that I'm really happy about just having had the opportunity to do is The Earth is Not Flat, which is the book of poems that came out of the Antarctica Fellowship um, from, the, from the National Science Foundation. And I got to, you know, get packed up and uh, sail the Drake Passage in a small ship in a gale uh, and go live on Palmer Station and write poems out of that. And that was a transformative experience, both for me and also for my work, I think. If we have any other questions, you can type them into the Q&A now. I have to say it's very strange not to see you. Uh, I'm glad to be here, but I wish I could see you all. Um, yes, Valerie wants to know if I've written fiction. I've written two novels. Um, the first one especially I don't entirely recommend. Uh, it's a mystery and I was trying to figure out how to do, do plot, which I did better. Um, that one's called The Measurable World. And uh, the second one is called um, Fire Season. And I, I do think that that's a better novel if you're interested in reading one. Um, and the Orem Public Library wants to know how we help children develop their voices in poetry. And I actually think that the way to do this is simply to expose them to poetry and especially to the pleasures of poetry. You know, not doing, I analyze po poems um, till the cows come home with my students, but um, my students are, they already know how pleasurable poetry is, um, how much fun it is just to listen to. And I would um, expose them to children's poetry, but I would also expose them to Emily Dickinson, um, who just in terms of the sound in her poetry, but also there are a lot of animals, etc., is just a great way to come into poetry. Robert Frost is a great way for kids to come into poetry. Um, and then out of that reading and chanting um, and the pleasures of engaging in poetry as readers, then um, children figure out what poetic language is about and what it's doing. And, and I think that they should start really young um, with poetry, even before they're really literate. You can, you can make poems out of sounds orally. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is that um, it's a really good idea if you want to develop voices, not to try to put put um, kids into boxes with their poetry. Whenever I judge a poetry contest where they're supposed to you know, write poems honoring the flag or something like that, it's always the kid who wrote something else, uh, who writes the best poems. So not to be too prescriptive or too restrictive. And Sarah wants to know, what have I always wanted to work on or with, but never had the chance to do um, and I'm going to give a terrible answer to that question, uh, which is I've been so privileged and so lucky that I have, especially in later years when I got brave enough to travel where I wanted to travel and to write what I wanted to write. Um, this is a lot easier, you know, after you have tenure at the university, et cetera. Um, I've always been able to manage to do what I want to do in the moment. Um, that's probably partly because, you know, I never thought that I needed to learn to play the saxophone or, you know, to make a blockbuster movie or something like that. Um, I'm really interested in what I get to do and very happy about it. Um, and Wanda wants to know about preserving all of the sketches and thank you so much for asking the, the deal that we have with the Smithsonian or the promise that we've made the Smithsonian, with the Smithsonian is that eventually all of the documentary materials will also um, go to the human studies archive. So even though they specialize in films, everything will be housed there together. Um, and I always thought that that would happen after I finished this book that I just read to you from. But my, um, my niece and her husband are both, um, are both historians. And Cody, Sasha's husband, is a historian of South America the of South America in the 20th century. And so I promised them that I'll hold on 
to that material until they know whether they want to use it. I suspect that they will at some point, and then it will go to the, the Smithsonian uh, after they're done. <clears throat> Well, if there are no more questions, it looks like we got through them all, which is fantastic. I talked as fast as I could. I hope not. I hope not too fast. And I should apologize for my voice, which is affected by the smoke. Um, so I'm sorry about my, my hoarseness. Uh, but I really enjoyed imagining you all uh, out there in an audience. And I do thank you so much for your time and attention. Well, thank you, Catherine. We appreciate having you. And we are right on time. So we're going to start just a little bit early with our ULA award videos. And I'll turn it over to Liz. Thank you again, Catherine. I am going to share my screen. And hopefully, you can see this video of Vern presenting our annual awards to our award recipients for this year. I'm also going to post the link to the video in the chat. So if the streaming doesn't work, you're welcome to view it on your own. Can I just add quickly, thanks to Rita, the president-elect for putting the video together for us. I'm Vern Waters, the immediate past president for ULA for 2019-2020. It's been such a pleasure, one of the greatest pleasures of my life to serve as president for you this past year. And what a strange year it's been. We had earthquakes, we had a pandemic that made us cause, caused us to cancel our conference. But I've been so amazed at the fine work that all of you do and inspired by so many things that all of you do. Um, we're going to introduce the 2020 award recipients, and I hope that you'll be inspired just as I have with the fine work that they've done. Thanks again. 
you so much for joining us. We will see you again at 1.30, which is when our next session will begin.